After the initial joy of beating Kentucky, he experienced years of grief. Uh, obviously, Kentucky was an all-white team. We were an all-black team. I, I, I was so naive at that time, I didn't even think about it until uh, after the game, and it started, you know, news people started bringing it to my attention, and I got home and started getting my hate letters in, the, uh, in, in big uh, trash cans. The press, you know, all the news media probably summed it up when playing Kentucky, uh, the blacks versus the whites, you know, but we didn't, re we didn't take that into knowledge, you know. Hey, we knew we had to go in there and play a good team, Kentucky, and we took it in that particular effort. There were positive points to Texas Western winning with black players. The victory helped to integrate college athletics. In fact, Kentucky recruited a black player the next year. But in 1968, Sports Illustrated published a series entitled The Black Athlete. Part three by Jack Olson dealt exclusively with the school now known as the University of Texas at El Paso. In part, Sports Illustrated alleged, none of the blacks on the championship team had degrees. Black athletes were put into Mickey Mouse courses. Blacks were not permitted to date white girls. Blacks did not pick up under the table money as whites did. The list goes on. UTEP officials deny the allegations. Black players said their words were taken out of context. Coach Haskins threatened to sue, but the damage had been done. UTEP's image and recruiting would suffer. Years later, in 1976, James Michener authored a book entitled Sports in America. He relied exclusively on the 1968 Sports Illustrated article, and he went on to say, and I'm quoting here, the blacks were conscripted from New York City, a bunch of loose-jointed ragamuffins ready for a brawl. Michener called them a gang of furious young men. You tip English professor Dr. Mimi Gladstein and seen enough. From 1976 to 78, she researched and co-authored a convincing report that refutes most of the allegations. The El Paso Times published the lengthy article. Sports Illustrated rejected it. Gladstein found UTEP not appreciably different than other major universities with an athletic department. I was who started or, or played most of the game, the championship game against Kentucky. Uh, that is the seven black starters. And I looked at uh, Kentucky's team, the seven main players from their team that were all white, and the exact same percentage had ended up graduating. James Mitchner made a number of inflammatory remarks about the Texas Western basketball team. Were you surprised about that? Well, I found his description was uh, using the same kinds of stereotypes that he deplored. And, um, and you know, it, it's something which to this day I hate the fact that that book, Sports in America, is, is there on the bookshelves and people doing research into the subject uh, will use it. In subsequent correspondence, Mitzer told Dr. Gladstein that he'd had regrets. In fact, he indicated he'd rooted for Texas Western to win. The years passed, the controversy faded. It was time for a joyous reunion. Champions of 66 had spread themselves across the country. El Paso businessman and minor supporter Joe Gomez decided to get the team together and organized a gala reunion complete with championship rings for the players. And I always felt like it was something they needed to, to receive 20 years later, but they are definitely not forgotten heroes. Believe me, they're not. Henry Silverman Jewelers generously made and donated 10 karat gold rings to the team. Even a somewhat rare orange stone called Pod Paracha was secured. It was decided to hand the rings over in the halftime ceremony of the Miners' final home game. The 66 players readily agreed to the invitation to come back home to El Paso. This would be a weekend they'd never forget. Every member of the championship team gathered for a photograph on the steps of Memorial Gym. The positioning was exactly the same as for a picture taken in 1966. These successful coaches, businessmen, and community leaders looked just as 20 years before when the NCAA title was theirs. I haven't seen most of these guys in just about 20 years, and i got to admit, they all look great, so it's nice. We were very close to like something we, we always have together, and as a team and, and, and as a bunch of guys, we're always together, too. And 20 years later, they were together again, El Paso honoring its heroes of 66. Among the superstars of yesteryear, the little O, who this day was in awe. It was very hard moment. Very hard moment. I, uh, it's been 20 years since we got a response like that. And it was some kind of response, an outpouring of emotion. What do I remember most? The camaraderie that they had. They were a real asset to El Paso. Talk about public relations, they had it. Everybody loves these miners. 
there was one sad note to this celebration of love. Willie Cager could not walk to the center of the court. Cager is the victim of a recent stroke. He has a history of heart problems, but those close to Willie tell me the affection he received has helped us speed his recovery. He's special. He is the best. Of all the members of this team, I think that Willie Cager uh, exemplifies Coach Haskins more than anyone else. He, uh, he is a tribute to, to Coach Haskins and all that he stands for. Some would call them the greatest thing to ever happen to El Paso. The 1966 Texas Western Miners, more than champions on the basketball floor, winners in the game of life. Hogo Rayleigh. 